welcome to everyone. And we're on to our second pair of Christmas characters that we're doing. Uh, last month we did Mary and Joseph. So we are on to John the Baptist and Jesus. If we can go into slide two, please, Andrew. Slide two, that's it, thank you. So Willie's going to be speaking on John the Baptist first, and then Mike's gonna be talking on Jesus afterwards. But first of, all, first of all, we'll start with a word of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you again for this opportunity to get together to study your word. And tonight, for us to look at what it teaches about John the Baptist and your son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. As we get closer to Christmas Day, when we celebrate his birth, we look forward to hearing more about the preparations that were made before he entered the world as a baby and all that means to us at this joyful time of year. Please be with Willie and then Mike as they speak to us. Be with all those that listen, that we may be blessed with what we hear through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now over to Willie. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. Um, I'd like to begin by looking at John the Baptist, and then Mike will pick up um, to look at the Lord Jesus Christ. So the two boys of Christmas, if you like, John and Jesus. Now, it's Luke's gospel that gives us the most information about John the Baptist's early life. Matthew, Mark, and John only introduce John the Baptist when he starts his ministry, baptizing people. And Luke is the one who gives us the story right from the beginning. But I want to start not with Luke, but with Malachi. Now, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, of course, as we know. And the final verses in Malachi say this. See, I will send the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. Now, I always think that's a really strange ending for, for any book. It's a really odd ending. It just kind of hangs there. What, what, what's the development? Malachi says nothing. And in fact, that's God's final word in the Old Testament. And we then get 400 years of silence. And the next time God steps into human affairs is when the old priest Zechariah who was chosen to go into the temple to burn incense, incense, he turns around and he finds himself face to face with Gabriel. And he was gripped with fear. Well, who wouldn't be gripped with fear at that sight? But Gabriel told him not to be afraid and revealed to him that he and his wife Elizabeth were going to have a son in their old age. And he was going to be a very special child. This is what Gabriel says about him. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. But if you look at these two quotes side by side, you see the connection, see the link that there is there? See that the connection between the two? It's as if the God of the Old Testament begins the New Testament by saying, as I was saying, and then takes it from there. So what can we learn about John the Baptist from Gabriel's announcement? If we can have the next slide, please. Gabriel gives quite a bit of information to Zechariah. First of all, he gives him the basic information. You are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, says uh, Gabriel. Well, so far, so normal. That's what you would expect from a, a, bo a baby boy or a baby girl for that matter. But what was to be so special about this child? This is what Gabriel says. Many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. That's in Luke 1, verses 14 to 16. But Zechariah didn't believe him. I mean, he and his, Elizabeth were far too old to have children. And because Zechariah did not believe Gabriel, he was struck dumb. And he stayed like that until the baby was born and came to be circumcised on the eighth day. And then Zechariah confirmed that he was to be called John. 
and his mouth was opened and he was able to speak again. So some interesting things there about John. But when Zechariah got his voice back, Luke tells us that he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he made some additional prophecies, additional to what Gabriel had said. So let's see the next slide for that. It's interesting, though, that when Zechariah begins to make his prophecies, he doesn't begin by talking about his son. You thought you would. If you were a father in that situation, you would be saying, look at my wonderful boy. But that's not what he says. He begins by talking about what has done, God has done for the nation. Let's look at what he said, because I think it's important to get the full picture here. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, as he said through his holy prophets so long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So look at the, the important things there that Zechariah is saying. The Lord has come and he's redeemed his people Israel. The son of David is coming just as the prophets long ago had forecast. He is going to deliver the nation from their enemies, and that had been established in the holy covenant that God had made with Abraham. Now, these predictions are being made not about John, but about Jesus. So it shows you the close link that there is between John and Jesus, that John's father, Zachariah, when his miracle baby was born, born in, in the old age of of both Zechariah and Elizabeth. The miracle baby was born, and he speaks about Jesus first, rather than his own son. So it shows the connection between them, but it also shows, I think, more importantly, the priority of Jesus. He is the more important of the two boys. Even to Zechariah, he's the more important of the two boys. The next slide, we get the further development when Mary, who is pregnant with uh, the baby Jesus arrives on a visit to Elizabeth, who is also expecting the baby John. See what Elizabeth says when Mary arrives. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. So as soon as Mary spoke to Elizabeth, the unborn joy, John leapt for joy in her womb. I think it's quite amusing, the final sentence there, blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished, perhaps in contrast to Zechariah upstairs, who didn't believe, and as a result was unable to speak. Remember, at that point, he's still unable to speak. So I often wonder if Mary, if Elizabeth is having a wee go at her husband. Maybe not, maybe not. But if we go back to Zechariah's prophecy about John, from verse 76 there in Luke chapter 1, Zechariah goes on to speak about John, and this is what he says, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. So that's what he says about Jesus. See the main point about John. See the main points there again. He's going to be a prophet of the Most High. He will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him. He'll give his people knowledge of salvation by forgiveness of sins. And he speaks of Jesus as the rising sun from heaven. So you can see Zechariah is identifying his son as the one who will go before the Lord, preparing the way for him. So to, the question, of course, arises to what extent did these predictions by both Gabriel and Zechariah come true? Let's look at the next slide. Now, John is a bit of a wild man, isn't he? Luke closes this piece of narrative about John by saying this, the child grew and became strong in spirit and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. He lived in the desert on his own, perhaps, in a community, 
uh, the Essene community, of course, were out in the desert, keeping away from the contamination of society. Maybe it was among them he grew up. Because the question arises, what happened to his parents? Zachariah and Elizabeth were both very old when John was born. So would they still be alive as he grew up? John must have been about 30 before he started his ministry, because just before Jesus did. Were his parents around then? Possibly not. So maybe that's why he went to live rough in the desert. Matthew 3 tells us that he wore clothes made of camel's hair with a, a leather belt round his waist, and he lived in locusts and wild honey. So he's a wild and isolated figure. He was out in the desert, and people came to him. So how did he see himself? Well, this is how Mark sums it up. He says, it's written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so, Mark says, John came baptizing in the desert and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, in there, you can see some of Zechariah's prophecies, can't you? You'll go before the Lord to prepare the way for him, and he will baptize the people for the forgiveness of their sins, repentance for the forgiveness of sins in the light of the one who is about to come. Right, the next slide. Here we look at Gabriel's prophecy. What, what was said about John by Gabriel? John uh, was to come in the power and the spirit of Elijah. So was John Elijah coming before the day of the Lord, just as Malachi had predicted? The problem is, I think, that John appears to have denied that he was Elijah. In John chapter 1, verse th uh, 20, we read this. He, that's John, John the Baptist, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him then, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. So a bit of a conundrum. He's to come in the power of Elijah. The prediction was that Elijah would come. And John says, no, I'm not Elijah. So we've got a bit of a problem there. Next slide. As I said, there's a close link between John and Jesus. So maybe we need to ask the question, what did John think of Jesus? I think the opening chapter of John's gospel says that John the Baptist warned the Pharisees that there was one standing among them whose sandals he, John, was not worthy to untie. And then he says this. The next day, we find this at least, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then he explained that this was the one he had been speaking of to the Pharisees and to the people. How did he know Jesus was the one? How did he know he was the right one? Well, he'd been told by God that there was a man he would baptize and he would see the Spirit descend on him, and he would be the one who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. So John concludes this. He says, I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. So John hadn't realized that Jesus was the Son of God, the one that was to come until he baptized him. That's what it says there. He says, I, I, the only reason I knew him was I was told that the Spirit would come on him in a, as a dove. So let's look at the Lord's baptism. Matthew's version of the story. There we find John baptizing in the Jordan and people going out to him. And Jesus went out too to be baptized. And Matthew then says this, John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But if you think about it, if John hadn't realized that Jesus was the Son of God until after he had baptized him and the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove, then that remark must have been a reflection of the kind of person Jesus was. Jesus had not yet started his ministry, but John knew him and he knew what he was like. And he knew that he was such a good man that John didn't feel worthy to baptize him. 
When I go to a Baptist church and we get many people who come for baptism, I don't think our pastor has ever said to anybody who's come for baptism, it's you that should be baptizing me, not the other way around. But that's what um, John said to Jesus. So you can imagine how John must have felt when he saw the Spirit descend on Jesus. It makes sense. It had to be him. No one else is like him. I think it's a fascinating insight, isn't it, to the kind of person Jesus was up to the age of 30 when he began his ministry. But there's one other point that we need to know about John and his view of Jesus. After Jesus began his ministry and Jesus' disciples were also baptizing people, they were kind of carrying on John's work, as it were. People drew John's attention to the fact that Jesus was attracting more people than John was. And John's response was to remind them that he'd already said that he was not the Christ. He was the friend of the bridegroom. He's the best man, if you like. But the real best man was the bridegroom, who is Jesus. And he finished by saying this, he must become greater. I must become less. It's an amazing attitude, isn't it? It's the one we might be as well to adopt as well in our lives, in our service for the Lord. He must become greater. We must become less. So John was a very great man. He knew what his place was in God's purposes, and he fulfilled his role completely. So if that's what John thought about Jesus, what did Jesus think of John? After John had been put in prison, the next slide, please, Andrew. After John had been put in prison, he sent some of his disciples to Jesus to confirm that Jesus actually was the one that was to come. Maybe things had turned out slightly differently from the way John had expected and he wanted some reassurance. But however, after Jesus had given him that reassurance, Jesus turned to the crowd and started to talk about John. He said to them, okay, you people went out into the desert. What did you go there to see? A reed shaken by the wind? No, you wouldn't go out for that. A man dressed in fine clothes? No, that's not the place to go if you want to see that. And then he went on, a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than he. Now, that is some statement to make about someone. But the Lord to say that is quite astonishing. And he continues, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who was to come. So they were back where we started, aren't we? John is the last of the prophets. Malachi predicted that Elijah would come first to prepare the way. Gabriel predicted that John would come in the power of Elijah. John himself said, no, no, I'm not Elijah to these unbelieving Jews. But here Jesus is saying that he would have been Elijah if only they'd believed in him. So John was a great man. There's no one greater than him, Jesus said. But he deferred, John deferred to the other character of Christmas that we still have to think about, the one who's at the heart of Christmas, the one whom John said he wasn't, un, he wasn't worthy to untie his sandals, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's who Mike's going to speak of next. Thanks very much for that, Will. Yeah, John the Baptist, interesting, interesting character. Just a couple of comments on John the Baptist. Um, First, I, I think of his father, Zachariah, right from the start, I feel sorry for Zachariah in a way. He had prayed for a child and his prayer had been heard and Gabriel was sent to tell him this. And yet, understandably, he asked, how can I be sure of this? And he hesit his hesitation and his unbelief are punished with nine months of being struck dumb. And many great characters in the Old Testament also found some things very difficult to believe if we read back there. And they asked for signs, and none of those were struck dumb like Zachariah was. So I've often felt sorry for him, and I've sometimes wondered how his disbelief actually, dis you know, differed from the ones in the Old Testament. And I don't know the answer to that question. And then just the second point on uh, on this, to me, it's striking that there's three mentions of being filled with the Holy Spirit, as Willie has mentioned in his talk. 
in such a short space of time, really. You've got John the Baptist, who would be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth, which actually makes him unique in scripture and unique among all other men. And then you've got Elizabeth, who's filled with the Holy Spirit when Mary greets her and the baby who's John leaps in her womb. And then finally, you've got Zachariah himself, who's filled with the Holy Spirit when the baby is circumcised and Zachariah gives him the name John. And so you have these three fillings of the Holy Spirit and, and Willie talked about all of those. So thanks very much for that, Will. Um, on the screen here, we've got a little booklet written by Mike on John the Baptist, his life, his teaching and his impact. And as usual, that's available from the Open Bible Trust. Um, but now we're going to go on to our second study, and Mike's going to give this on Jesus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Well, Willie questioned this thing about John the Baptist and Elijah. It's a very interesting question, and I've written this book, Was John the Baptist Elijah? Because it's quite an interesting theological jigsaw, actually. Uh, it's very interesting, but... Uh, I'm not going to say any more about it because I'm going to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's very interesting when Gabriel spoke to Zechariah about John, it tells us in Luke 1 17 that John will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, quite often we concentrate on that in the spirit and power of Elijah and we pass over the Lord. But this was an incredible statement from Gabriel that this son of his will go on before he, well, if you like, you could say Jehovah, because the Lord is the word kurios in the Greek, which is often used when they quote from the Old Testament of Elijah. So he is saying here about this one who is to come later than John the Baptist, that he is really the Lord. He is you know, the Messiah. Yeah, so, okay, next slide, please. So, that's what Gabriel says to Zechariah. What does he actually say to Mary about this one? All right. He tells her, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. That's the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew Joshua. And of course, Joshua was the great savior of the people that took them into the promised land. And so here you are, you could call him Jesus, Joshua, savior, leader, the one who will take you into the promised land. And he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. I wonder what Mary was thinking at this time. And he goes on to say, the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Wow. There's this young lady, this young girl. Um, and what, what does she pick out of this? Um, well, you know, of all the theological things, I probably wouldn't have picked out what she picked out. But then I'm not a woman. She was a young woman. And what she picks out is, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? So it was a very practic practical question that she wanted to know the answer to and very understandable when you think about it. So this son is to be called Jesus. He's going to be the son of the most high God. But how is it going to happen, says Mary? And so the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So there's no ambiguity A Son of the Most High, some people may quibble about that. What does he mean by the Most High? Well, the Most High he's referring to is God. He's going to be called the Son of God, and he will be holy. And remember what the word holy, the basic root meaning of holy is to be separate, to be different. And of course, this child that Mary was going to have was going to be very, very different from any other child child because he was going to be the son of the most high god the son of god wow number 14 please now it's interesting again talking about elizabeth when elizabeth um, talks to mary she says to her blessed are you amongst women 
and blessed is the child you will bear. Just calls him a child. And then she says, but why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? There's that word Lord again, you know. Um, and so Elizabeth knew that the child that Mary was going to be was going to be the Lord. Now, how did she know that? Or did Zachariah tell her? Well, he couldn't have told her because <laughs> he was dumb. <laughs> He'd been struck dumb, but we know he could write. So did Zachariah write and tell Elizabeth what the angel Gabriel had told him? And so that she knew um, that uh, this was going to be the Lord. Or was it a revelation that God had spoke to her? I don't know. But uh, she knew somehow that Mary was going to be the mother of my Lord. Wow. Number 15, please. So, okay. So Mary's going to have a child. She gets pregnant. And she tells her boyfriend. And what's the boyfriend going to do? Walk away. Yeah. Divorce her privately. Could have been under the law of Moses. Put her to public disgrace, which was meant stoning to death outside their parents' house. Her parents' house. Wow. That would have been terrible, wouldn't it? So what was Joseph going to do? He decided he would put her away privately and have a private divorce. Break the agreement. Um, he obviously was an honourable man to do that, and it tells us that in, in Matthew, that he was a righteous man. So it looks like, with all the information he had, to do a private divorce was the right thing to do from his point of view and everything. But that's not what God planned. So in Matthew 1, 20 to 21, Joseph, son of David, said the angel in a dream, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. He's backing up what Gabriel told Mary, and no doubt Mary had told Joseph. Now the angel is confirming it and telling Joseph, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Here it is again, the Joshua, the Savior. Why? Why is he going to be called Jesus? Because he will save his people from their sins. So here it is, the Angel now is confirming what Mary probably had told Joseph. The angel had told Mary, and Mary had told Joseph, and Joseph says, oh, I don't know about all that. A bit much for me. I, I, no, I'm going to... No, you go your way, Mary, and I'll go my way. No, says the angel. You take her for your wife. And in Matthew's comment in verse is 22, 23, um, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That was from the prophet Isaiah. And so this one now, this son of the most high, this son of God, is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And that is what we celebrate at this time of year, the incarnation, God became man. And I'm so pleased that he did for many reasons. But one reason, it gives me great comfort to think that God in the person of Christ experienced all the problems of humanity. You and I have problems. No doubt God could appreciate them, if I may say so, without being irrelevant intellectually. But when he became man, he could experience them practically. Just think about it. Think what he went through. Joseph died quite young, I suppose. And Jesus had four brothers and two or three sisters. And as the eldest son, it would be upon him to look after his mother and his younger siblings, and particularly his sisters, until they were married. That may explain, humanly speaking, why he didn't start his ministry to 30. Then when you think about his ministry, look at the opposition he got, and the unfair treatments he got from the authorities. Quite, quite shocking, really. And the opposition and what they said about him accused him of being satanic and by Beelzebub and all this sort of terrible stuff that they said about him. Have we had terrible stuff said about us? Well, I have. <laughs> Perhaps I deserved it. I don't know. 
Anyway, then of course we had the death of Lazarus. And he put his arms, I always imagine him putting his arms around Martha and Mary and crying with them at, at, at the tomb, sharing in their sorrow. I think that's why he cried, because of their sorrow, because he knew what he was going to do. So he knew that Lazarus would come back alive. Then you think of his group of friends, the Twelve. Well, they all deserted him in his hour of need, and one of them betrayed him. Have we ever been let down by our friends? I, well, I have. And I expect you have at times. He was terribly. And then, of course, he was arrested, beaten, battered. He knew what physical pain was like. Um, you know, many, many people, when they get older, have this terrible sciatica and things like this and end up on painkillers and can't cope some people with the pain they're in. Well, think what he went through in the pain and then having a crown of thorns thrust on his head before being crucified. So I've just touched on a few of the unpleasant things, the terrible things that happened to Jesus as a man, if you like. Uh, and so he knows when we pray to him, needing his grace and his strength, he understands. And that, that, that's very important to me. And I think it's very important theological point too. Number 16, please. Anyway, Matthew one twenty four tells us when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Took Mary home as his wife. So where was his home? Well, a little bit uh, in Luke 2, 4 to 6, although they were living in Nazareth, and Nazareth was not their home. Where was their home? Well, it was the Bethlehem, the town of David. And Luke 2, 4 to 6 says, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to a firstborn, a son. Some interesting things there. The, the the nativity that we have at Christmas is a great bit of drama, but there's so much you know you wouldn't get you wouldn't leave Nazareth in the morning and get to Bethlehem in the evening because it's a eight to ten day journey. And the, why was there no room in the inn? Because while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. So it looks like they were already in there when the time came for the baby to be born. It may have been there some time. Well, it tells us that. Joseph took Mary home as his wife. So home was Bethlehem. So maybe once he knew that she was pregnant and wow. And once they knew they had to go to Bethlehem, they go down there, they go to Bethlehem. In my book, I think they probably got married. And while they were staying there with relatives probably who owned the inn, the time came for the baby to be born. And so once that had happened, Mary would be unclean under the law of Moses. And anyone who came in contact with her would become unclean. So she had to be taken out of the inn. There was no sort of, it was probably fully booked because of this census that was going on. So they had to find her a place, maybe a, as they think, traditionally a stable where the animals were, clean it out, put a manger in there for the baby to be laid. And this son of God, this son of the Most High, was born in one of the poorest towns in Judea. He was born in one of the poorest nations of the Roman Empire. That's humility for you, isn't it, eh? You would not expect Emmanuel to be, want to be born in a place like that. Number 17, please. Okay. So there they are. They're in this uh, place. Let's call it a stable, although it may be a cave. I don't know. Let's call it a stable. And hang on a moment. All of a sudden, the angels appear. Now, who do they appear to? Well, in Luke 2, 11 to 12, the angels say to these shepherds, Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Wow, look at that. So, the shepherds, 
Well, they were some of the most lowly people looked down upon in Israel. Um, they were quite often unclean um, because of lambing and things like this. And uh, they go and see Mary. Um, but Mary's unclean. So it doesn't really matter. So, so whereas other people wouldn't want to go and see Mary if they were on the way, staying in the inn and on the way to Jerusalem to go to the temple or whatever. But the shepherds, well, they didn't mind. They were already unclean. So let's go and see this. And the angel doesn't tell them where to go. He just says, you'll find a babe lying in a manger wrapped in cloths. So they have to go through the town looking for this baby, probably knocking on doors. Anyway, they eventually see the baby, it tells us, Luke 1, 16. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Wow. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what a shepherd said to them. So here's the first evangelists, if you like. The angels tell them to look for this baby. They go through the town knocking on doors. No, there's no baby here, no baby here. You wouldn't have a baby in the manger, not here, no. They find the baby in the manger. They worship him. And then they go back and tell all these people the details of what the angels have said was true. And they had found this child, this one whom the angels said was a savior and was the Messiah. Wow. I, I bet the shepherds never forgot that night. Number 18, please. Anyway, <clears throat> on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. So you can see that Joseph did his duty, if you like, as the stepfather. They call, Luke calls him a child. But he gives him this name, Jesus, this Joshua, this savior. Number 19, please. Then when he's about 40 days old, after Mary's now he's quite got over a period of uncleanness, they take him to the temple in Jerusalem to make a sacrifice and an offering. They would enter the temple, go through the court of the Gentiles, the outer courts. Then they would go into the court of the women which was as far then as Mary could go. And then Joseph would then go right up into the men's court and then make his sacrifice, giving the two pigeons, two doves to the priests. But before they got there, they met a man called Simeon. And this is what Simeon said in Luke 2, 29 to 32. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you are prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. It's interesting that Christ is called here your salvation. It's a name of Christ, your salvation. And at the end of the book of Acts, if you remember right at the end, after we have that final pronouncement of the deafness and blindness and hardness of heart of Israel, Paul then says in Acts 28, 28, that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles. Now, is that the message of salvation as most people interpret it? Well, it may well be actually, but it could mean your salvation has been sent into the Gentiles, i.e. Jesus is being sent into the Gentiles now. And instead of being center, centered in Israel, Jesus was going to be centered in the Gentile nations. Whether that's what it means there or not, I don't know. But it's interesting that Simeon calls Jesus your salvation. Next slide, please. And then along comes Anna. Uh, she, she came up to them at that very moment also. She gave thanks to God and spoke about the child. To all who were looking forward to the redemption in Jerusalem. So she spoke about the child to all those who were looking for redemption in Jerusalem. Now, how many were looking for redemption in Jerusalem at that time? Practically the whole city. I'm not saying she spoke to all the city, but that's all the Jews really wanted was to have is Jerusalem, Judea, and the nation redeemed from the Romans. 
That's what they were really looking for. Um, not necessarily redemption from sin, unfortunately, but they wanted redemption from the yoke of Rome. 21, please. So then a little while later, maybe 15 months, 18 months, something like that, the wise men turn up and see Herod. And in Matthew 2, 2, they ask Herod a question. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and I've come to worship him. Where is the one born king of the Jews? What did Herod make of that? Well, Herod understood what that meant. He called the chief priests and teachers of the law. And what did they tell them in Matthew 2, 4? He asked them, or he asked them, where the Messiah was to be born. So Herod, although he was an Idumenian and had been put in charge of uh, Jerusalem and Judea by, first of all, Julius Caesar, and then authorized by the Senate to have the title king, uh, and he obviously learned a lot about Judaism in his ensuing years, he knew that this prophesied king of the Jews was actually the Messiah. So I can't understand why he then went and wanted to kill them all, because he must have known he was fighting against God if he believed in him. 22, please. Anyway, the chief priests and teachers of the law, this is what they said to Herod. Matthew 2, verses 5 to 6, in Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people in Israel. My people Israel. Years, years I think, is the first time he's called a shepherd. And this, of course, is, is a picture we liked, isn't it, of Jesus the shepherd from we as sheep. You know, these people as sheep. But he's going to be the ruler. And he's going to be born or has been born in Bethlehem. Number 23, please. So after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed, and coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So this child now is probably no longer a baby. They're no longer in a stable or a cave, they're in a house. And so they worship him and give him their gifts. Next slide, please. So that must have been an incredible experience for Mary and Joseph to see these dignitaries come and bow down and worship their toddler son and give him these exotic gifts. But in Luke 2, 13 to 15, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream again. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Wow, as I said, I can't understand Herod. If he knew this child was going to be called the king of the Jews and that he was the Messiah, well, he ought to know he couldn't win that battle. Anyway, Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. So there the Lord Jehovah is calling him my son. He's the son of God. He's the son of the Most High. This is the one. And they go to Egypt. Now, many people think they went all the way to the Nile. Now, the jurisdiction of Herod, you can see it on that map there, only goes about uh, 50 miles south of Jerusalem, or something like that. And then the rest of below that came under the jurisdiction of Egypt, believe it or not. So they, they didn't have a month's journey or more going to Egypt. They probably had a few days journey south of um south of Judea, and they then were outside of Herod the Great's kingdom, and he could not touch them because they then came under the procurator of Egypt. 
25, please. Anyway, now what happened? Well, it wasn't long after that that actually Herod died. And in Matthew 2, 19 to 21, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared to, in a dream to Joseph again. This time he was still in Egypt, just below that. You can see Idumea in, in the, uh, on that map, and the, the jurisdiction of Egypt was just a little south of that. And the angel said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he, took, he got up, took the child and his mother, and went off, set off to the land of Israel. Okay, 26, please. So they were getting close to the land of Israel when Joseph had another dream. Because he had heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod. So he was afraid to go there. Because would Archelaus do the same as Herod? Because Archelaus was much better. He was a bit better, I think. So, what, you know, had Herod told him about this, uh, this uh, situation? And anyway, if they had gone to live in um, Bethlehem, Jesus would have stuck out as a, as a very unusual person as a child because all the other male children of his age had been killed. So he would be the only one. So Joseph, having been warned in a dream, withdrew to the district of Galilee up north. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said to the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. He would be called a Nazarene. So which prophets was it that uh, prophesied that? I haven't got a clue. <laughs> you, you can search the Old Testament prophecies and you won't find anything like it. It's quite an enigmatic statement. So is he is, is, is uh, Matthew writing here some oral tradition or something? There are lots of different views over what, what Matthew means by that. Um, but I won't go into that because it doesn't really matter. It's a side issue. So here is Jesus, Joshua, Savior, Emmanuel, Shepherd, Son of God, Son of the Most High. And we could go on and on. But most of all, remember, What's important to us, he is our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we have eternal life because we believe he died for our sins and rose again for our justification. Thanks be to him. Amen. Thank you. Many thanks, Mike. That was, uh, that was excellent. I think over the course of, uh, of this uh, session and also the one that we had uh, a month ago, We've obviously had the stories of, of Mary and Joseph and now John the Baptist and, and Jesus. And of course, they were all intricately entwined. And of course, we, we end up going through the same events. But I think it's been interesting. We've gone through those events uh, from, from different perspectives. Um, we've just heard now of the, the story of the first few years of the life of Jesus uh, from conception through to his arrival in Nazareth. We have the angel Gabriel appearing to Zachariah, Mary and Joseph, Mary's visit to Elizabeth, the journey to Bethlehem, the actual birth of Jesus, the shepherds, Simeon and Anna, the wise men, and finally the escape to Egypt and the journey returning back to Nazareth. And it, it has obviously over the course of the years that we've been studying it all become very, very familiar. And it is easy to, to lose the wonder and joy that uh, should be created by this within us. It really is the greatest story ever told when, when our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, was, was born on earth, God incarnate. I read an article recently by Stephen Whitmer, which said, it's possible to become so familiar with Jesus that we know him as a Sunday school answer, rather than as a mind-blowingly great, heart-meltingly beautiful Lord who makes his claim upon our lives to whom we owe everything, who alone gives us lasting joy and who deserves all our worship. I think as we now kind of move into the kind of the more intense period of Christmas, it's good to try and see the, the story of Jesus' birth uh, with fresh eyes this Christmas. Right, so before we finish, I will just uh, uh, give you a quick prayer. So, the Lord and Heavenly Father, uh, 
we, we thank you that we're able to, uh, to study your word and in particular this evening, share together uh, the story of the, of the birth of, of your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and everything that went around it. And I ask, Lord, that we might be able to see the story of your son's birth with fresh eyes this Christmas. And also that we might be inspired again to, to tell others of the fantastic gospel message. And now, Lord, I ask that uh, as we part, that you'd be with each and every one of us uh, and that you'd be with us throughout the coming weeks. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.